Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 32 of Interstellar Quest, and our epic space station, our power station, is nearing its final location. At least for now, we are shifting it into a 330 kilometer altitude orbit. Why 330 kilometers? Uh, that's when I get bored with this thing that accelerates incredibly slowly. But 330 kilometers is pretty good. It puts it uh, several. It puts it high enough that I can get over. 270 degrees of, of arc uh, observation. So I can cover a fairly large part of the sky and uh, the orbital period is about 50 minutes. So if you are on the dark side of the planet, as in dark relative to the power transmission, it won't be long before this thing is visible once more. So we, of course, are producing power now. It's time to activate our antenna, activate transceiver, and already you see the megajoules draining out of the system. And of course, in the off week, where, while we're waiting to build another rocket seven days between launches, we've developed a new nuclear-powered aircraft. This one uses a thorium reactor. This is also using the large uh, RAM air intake, and it has to use the special cooling body there. Well, it lifts up nicely. Now, most of the experiments you see are condensed into these B9 uh, experiment packages. Uh, that ba the one on the right is an atmosphere package. The one on the left adds, um, it's just like the thermometer, the seismometer, and all the other stuff baked into one. But it lifts off fairly nicely, and with the liquid fluoride thorium reactor there, we get higher core temperatures, and uh, we ultimately get more thrust. The air intake should actually make a big difference as well. Overall, we're going to do a lot better. Also, we don't have any onboard power generation. It's entirely handled through lightweight solar cells. And 15 minutes into the flight, you can see this has performed exceptionally well. We are almost at the North Pole. We're traveling at over one kilometer per second, over Mach 3. If you remember the the previous vehicle I built, whoa, oh dear, dear, dear. Come on, get yourself straight. Nice, uh, Jebediah showing off your skills there. Actually, I'm wanting to slow down, so that spin out is great. Oh look, there we are, over Kerbin's Tundra. That's exactly where I want to go, the biome that I haven't visited yet on the planet Kerbin. Well, there's that and the Badlands. Those are the two biomes. Oh dear, uh, this plane, oh wow. Look at the g-forces on this thing when I'm turning. That's actually a pretty effective way to slow down, I have to say. We slowed down from like one kilometer per second down to 500 meters per second. Basically, because we have that large air intake, we were able to travel much higher and therefore travel much faster. We were able to generate more thrust in more rarefied atmosphere. Now, the interstellar pack, they now require that air intakes above a certain speed, they generate a lot of heat and they will cause the engines to overheat if you do not attach the engines to a pre-cooler. So that's what that engine body is there, right? That engine body is cooling the air so that we can use it. Without that, the aircraft would probably overheat uh, once we got up to speed and we would have trouble. Oh, you look down and you see a glimmer. There's cold in them thar hills. Har har de har har har. Excellent. Okay, so we're now going to try and figure out how to land here, and you can see this is wobbling a lot. I mean, we are going still faster. Even though we slow down, we're still going faster than the 200 meters per second that the other nuclear aircraft was capable of. This is a new chapter in nuclear aircraft development. I mean, literally, this thing was going four to five times faster than the previous experimental model. And I'm sure we will be able to go faster still once we come up with the technology to develop upgraded reactors. It, you can see also when it's turning, like 10 Gs, that will squish Jebediah if he wasn't such a badass. He is the badass. Through the color of his skin, you can tell he's badass. Yeah, somebody actually pointed out, I may, may have mentioned this in a previous episode, that uh, the color of the Kerbal's skin is a an Easter egg which spells badass. Uh, B-A-D-A -A in hexadecimal 55 is a kind of lime green that is very close to the color of the Kerbal's skin. May be deliberate, may not, but it's pretty funny nevertheless. So we're just going to come down and we have to 
slow slow down enough that we can actually land. This is the only part I haven't tested yet. You see, the thing does have a tendency to spin out and pancake uh, at high Mach values, but it appears to fly pretty well once we slowed things down. The tundra is mostly rolling hills, so there's just a question about picking the exact landing sites. We can collect all the science we can here. Obviously, I'm saving the um, exposure and array and the, the materials array and the magic blob, the, the green blob or whatever, the mysterious blob, that's mysterious, that's the word we're looking for. The mysterious un blob, unlocking the mysteries of the tundra. Okay, okay, now we've bled off most of our velocity, I will reactivate the engine, bring it back online just a little to make sure we have some power to help us over the hills if we uh, encounter a hillside coming at us rather too quickly. And even though I forgot to fit Kerbal Engineer, I'm really glad the sun is there putting the shadow exactly where I need it. Just trying to go, this thing, oh there we go, now we've got a break without, whoa, I see a bit of a shimmy there, but I think, okay we're bringing the speed down, perfect, 15 point landing, there we go. 30 meters per second, 20, 19, 15, just slow down. Slow down and land. Hey, excellent Jebediah, we knew you could do it. So now we're in the new undiscovered territories of the tundra. Let us collect all the science we can and send it back home. So what have we got going on? We got the sensor package, which we'll need to log some data, seismic data, I guess. Some of these things have already been logged already. It appears there is normal seismic activity under the layers of dirt, frozen dirt, obviously. And log gravity data. The sensor seems to think it's being calibrated, being calibrated in a cold environment. And the other ones, the screen displaying temperature information is continuously showing bad temperature puns. Really? That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's cold enough to keep your things permanently frozen. Yes, that's more like it. Uh, observe the mystery goo. The goo seems to do a little dance as it bounces around the container. That's the spelling. It's bounces. Observe the... Yes, the materials show little signs of change, though one of the samples appears to be judging you slightly. Yeah, and of judging me to be a badass... Jebediah, let's jump off. Uh, incidentally, if you're using the B9 pack, you can't remove experimental data from the, those experiment packages, so uh, yeah, need to fix that. The ground here seems to be completely frozen. It was very hard to scoop up a sample. It seems we are on our home planet. Well, might as well plant the flag while we're here. Let's, what should we call it? Tundra Base 1? Tundra-tastic? Tun... I'll call this Tundra Landing Site, and we'll make some comment. The new nuclear plane is fast, but this thing will really fly well when we can take it to EVE, and that will let us explore it. Maybe by the time we get there, we'll have like 0.24 and we'll have biomes. Anyway, a week later, of course, our rocket people have a new launch. They've managed to get their space in the launch pad, and this thing, well... It moves rather ponderously slowly at first, but it is actually quite a short rocket. There's only two of those tanks and a half-length, you know, Rocket Max tank. Uh, we have a single engine on the bottom there, and, well, we have a very large fairing. The fairing belies... Uh, it, it's, it's deceptive. The fairing actually contains a space probe which is going to exploit the beamed power from this uh, power network which they've just put into space. It will let the spacecraft move to you know, some ridiculous speeds and the idea is we will be able to take this to another place, to a, a target, without waiting for a launch window. So of course we're going to skip through most of this. Of course, four times normal speed. It does move rather slowly at first, and that's just simply because the thrust-to-mass ratio isn't quite there. But honestly, it doesn't need it. Once it gets up in space and this thing gets going, I figure out on paper this has something like 50 kilometers per second of delta V. And I say 50, 5 zero, not 15. Uh, that is, of course, because it gets most of its power from the power network. And there we have our magnificent little vehicle here. 
we have two uh, antennas that we're going to use, one on each side, and they are mounted on a pivoting gizmo thingy here. We, we're mounted on a rig that lets us angle the power stuff in either direction, so we can always get 100% perfect power reception. Now, people ask me, is wireless power really a thing? There's a few people who didn't believe it exists. Well, first of all, wireless power does actually exist. You can today buy a wireless charging system for your cell phone or remote control or whatever. I mean, there's like, you can literally have a bowl that you throw, you know, your tablets and your cell phone in and it magically charges them via resonant induction charging. That's where you basically have coils in the charging system and coils in the device. And what usually you get is a case for your phone, which includes wire coils that are designed to resonate at exactly the frequency of the bowl. And because they're they're resonant, the small driving force lets the power build way up and you can actually transfer significant amounts of power that way. So it's great for charging devices without plugging them in. It makes a lot of sense for devices that are going to be completely sealed. You know, so you could in theory build like a uh, an authentication token, such as an authentication card where you just wave it in front of the device and it just works. That is a that is actually a, an application of wireless power if you've ever seen such a thing. But uh, this thing uh, is going to do something else. This is going to do actual beamed power. Now, you know, wireless power chargers are very close range. This is much, much longer range, as you can guess. This thing is going to be able to take a beam of power Fo and it, it doesn't really focus it down. The focusing is actually done by making sure that all the antennas are aligned and in phase correctly. Anyway, we are on a, a suborbital trajectory here, or at least we are, We will fall back. We're just going to adjust these antenna here. We, have, we switch it out into this T-shaped formation first. Then uh, we're going to... We know that the, the antenna system or the production station is above and behind us. So we adjust it that way, and then hopefully if we... Hmm. It says disable. I thought it was enabled, but it isn't working. Um, in theory, that is supposed to be pointed the right way. Where is it? It's roughly over there. Maybe I need to turn it more. Uh, let's try turning this just... To, no. Uh, engine. Engine is not working. That's... Engine has started. Okay, but we still... Engine shut down due to lack of electrical power. Well, that worked really well. And I'm not having this thing come online. Uh, I hope I figure this out before I come around and crash. I mean, I've only got like, you know, two hours to figure it out. Let's try switching to the reactor control room, the reactor control station. We need a better name for that as well. Let's call it Prometheus Broadcast. Oh, let's call it the Nikola Tesla Memorial Station. There we go. Oh, hey, one science has been added to the R&D center. Well, that will be uh, bringing us ever slowly towards... Where is it? Where's the R&D center gone? Where has my Nikola Tesla station gone? It looks like it's... Ah, there you are. Look at you, hanging majestically in space. Well, the transmitter does appear to be working. Uh, it says even that it's beaming power. I'm not sure why it wouldn't be getting received. This is a bad time to find out that it doesn't work. Generator's running. The power station's running. I have no idea why this is choosing not to run. Um, I should probably ask Heramon if he knows what's going on. This engine... Maybe I'll shut down this engine. Maybe that's taking all its power. After all, I don't really need it. Uh, should I shut down the lab? No, let's... Let's... Have you tried turning off and on yet? Oh, that's the worst version of that accent, isn't it? <laughs> okay, it seems to be running. Let's go back. Where is it? There we are, rising above the horizon. We need to fix this orbit sooner rather than later, because later is when we smack into the ground. Okay, focus on the Falcon. And it is... Where is it? It, too, is very hard to see. Oh, there it is there. Tiny silhouetted against the sky, alone in space, and now receiving power. There we go. Look at that. So we have, although this does get a little off center, we've included like a little uh, reaction wheel unit in there to keep the thing pointed. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can do this to make sure that the antenna is always pointed the right way. But the antenna has to be pointing at the thing in question. 
And so now it's time for old me, a uh, new me, old me to say bye or not to talk. But o- old me would probably just be complaining about how long this took because you know this thing is accelerating at uh, it's got a three kilonewtons of thrust, so it actually accelerates relatively quickly because uh, it's a quite a small object. All the same, we're trying to accelerate to like seven, six, seven kilometers per second. Our plan is to go to Dres. Now, we don't have a launch window for Dres for 60 days, I think, or something like that. I figure that uh, if we cut around the inside of the sun and use a very narrow trajectory and a high-speed fly past, we should be able to get a flyby of Dres in 60 days. So you see that we have this little Mega Jewels display. That's what is in the bottom right corner there, right? That's the... Uh, that's your power information from Interstellar. As I was saying, yeah, this is beamed microwave power. Microwave power works in a different way. It uses something called a rectenna. That's a rectifying antenna, which takes the oscillating magnetic field produced by a microwave beam and turns it into power. You see, but uh, it's essentially a wave going up and down. Well, a rectifier takes that and Make sure it always is at a constant level. Now, this is exactly what happens in more mundane applications. You know, you get uh, when you get your cell phone or whatever, you have a little power brick for plugging into the wall. That basically takes the oscillating 110, 220, whatever, the oscillating AC current from the wall, rectifies it, steps it down. You know, usually it steps it down and then it rectifies it. But the point is, it turns an oscillating wave into a flat constant electrical charge doing it with uh, radio waves perfectly possible and in fact there are trials to send uh, power to certain remote locations in uh, near the north pole apparently uh that's what i've heard i think canada's experimenting it with some of their uh places basically it's cheaper to beam stuff across you know the space and take the power losses than it is to actually build cables And of course, it works a lot better if you can do it in deep space, where there is no possibility for putting cables in. So there, we're getting very close. We've actually escaped the... Oh no, we're still inside the sphere of influence of the planet Kerbin. So we're still... We're getting up to 6.5 kilometers per second. That is pretty darn ridiculous. One of the problems I have in post-commentary is that I can't actually read the numbers in question all the time. I mean, the beauty of this whole thing is, of course, that we do not need to carry a power plant around that is capable of generating all this uh, electrical power. We just need to carry an antenna that is big enough to carry. And that way, we get much better thrust-to-weight ratios, even although we're not getting all of the power. Even getting a fraction of the power is a huge boon. We're going to get an encounter with Drez in 55 days, and we're going to trim it just a little to get it as close as possible. You know the beauty of this is? We probably still have another 50 kilometers per second of delta V. The real question is, as we get out there, how will our power drop off? I mean, if we can get any power, enough, if we can get enough power to run this plasma thruster, then we can come back. If we can't get enough power to run it, then uh, we'll just have to beam the information back and take the science loss. But there's more than enough delta V on this thing to bring it back uh, and into curb in orbit. And that is the plan. It will get there probably a few days after the Duna probe, probably while I'm still working on on, uh, getting it into orbit. Speaking of which, the Duna probe just reached its uh, midpoint course correction and... While it was, of course, incredibly tedious to steer, it's, we spent more time turning it towards the uh, the thrust vector than we did actually thrusting along that vector. We were able to trim its orbit to pass by the planet Duna within a few hundred kilometers, and uh, we'll make a correction just before we enter Duna's sphere of influence. But other than that, the crew is in good shape. They are in good spirits. They are playing uh, space chess or something, no doubt. But in a few episodes time, we will probably be ready for the actual arrival at Duna. But until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.